Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Attendance Bias. I'm your host, Brian Weinstein. A few months ago, I arranged an episode with a guest who wanted to talk about Fish's performance of Free from August 2nd, 2022 at the Blossom Music Center in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. After trying to set up a recording date and a time with the guest, things fell through, and I was left with a great jam and a boatload of notes with no one to talk to about it. I put out a call on Fish Twitter, and I got such a response. It seemed like everybody wanted to talk about this jam, and I can see why. Luckily, we were able to arrange two guests for this fantastic episode. One returning guest, Mike Lowe, who was previously on Attendance Bias to discuss the all-time version of Fluffhead from Alpine Valley 99. And a brand new guest, Mercedes from Fish Twitter, or you may know her better as ZZ Benz. Either way, it was a perfect way to blend the familiar with the new to go over what several people referred to as the 2022 Jam of the Year. Moving through several sections, Fish took the second set opener and took the audience on a musical journey that felt like it was composed and spontaneous at the same time, but I don't want to spoil it. So let's join Mercedes and Mike to talk about summer 2022, planetarium music, and Hanson, as we discuss Free from August 2nd, 2022 at Blossom. Mike and Mercedes, welcome and welcome back to Attendance Bias. For everyone listening, we have two guests today. We have Mike Lowe, who is a returning champion, previously here to talk about one of the best fluff heads ever played. And Mercedes, uh, who you may know from Fish Twitter, is brand new to Attendance Bias. So, Mike, how are you doing? And then Mercedes, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Ready to excited to talk about this jam in the show, maybe a little bit. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm doing really well. I also am excited to talk about uh, what I believe is the jam of the year. Oh. And that jam, for those of you who just rushed to press play and didn't look at the title of today's episode, is specifically free from August 2nd, 2022 at Blossom in Cuyahoga Falls, which I believe is right outside Cleveland. Is that right, Mercedes? Correct. Before we get into the jam, before we get into 2022, Mike, you've been a previous guest, so you've been through the lightning round. Is it disorienting? How do you feel about it? Did you live? I lived. Yeah, you got to stay on your toes. Yeah, yeah, you got to you know, watch out around me and, and just fish. go with your gut. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the that's the secret. Don't think too hard about any answer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Mike, you've been through it. So I'm going to mostly pepper Mercedes with questions. But Mike, anything you want to chime in, or if I ask a question that you didn't hear the first time around, just feel free to rip right in and answer it yourself. All right. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. So let's start with the attendance bias lightning round. Attendance bias lightning round. Mercedes, what was your first fish show and what do you remember from it? My first fish show was, oh, I always mess up the exact date. It was June 26th, 2004. So I'm technically a 2.0er. So I had just graduated high school. Um, It was like the first time I would be like allowed to kind of do a thing like a fish concert. Um, And I also knew, you know, it was the last tour. Fish was breaking up forever. uh, So this was my only chance to see them. I could only do the second night of that Alpine run because I couldn't miss my grandpa's 102nd birthday, which was two days before. Wow. Yeah. So I had to drive on the day of the first night. Obviously didn't make it there in time, didn't get in. And then the second day, that was my first and what I thought last fish show uh what i remember from it it's funny because this past summer was the first time i'd returned to alpine valley since that show and i i envision it differently in my mind from 2004 than it actually is well i'm Um, curious about that what did you know going in what was 2004 like for you because it's different for every fish fan yeah so i was like a very baby fish fan then i'd been exposed to them for like the prior two years and then only really started getting into them that last year like 2003 into 2004 i didn't listen to live shows unless they were like a live fish release 
um, I was coming from like having been a teeny bopper to like all of a sudden like loving this band that is focused on improvisation and like live music. So studio albums were more palatable for me at first in like the start of my fish journey. And I didn't like know what to expect going into it. I think I the only like jam band shows I'd been to before fish was like Keller Williams, which is pretty tame yeah. um which is like a great intro for it and so i'd just never seen anything like a fish show before at alpine valley no less at yeah. alpine like valley, the no biggest less. venue yeah mm-hmm. and i was like at the time super naive in a lot of ways um but i tried very hard to like I don't know, not, not appear as naive as I was. So like trying to (laughs) act like I wasn't phased by things, right. Trying to act like I wasn't like scared in certain situations when like I definitely was. And like my first show story is kind of insane. The people I was with made some interesting choices that weekend. It sounds like we already need to have you back (laughs) on to talk about. I know (laughs) (laughs) it's a different show we could talk about, but, um, Suffice it to say, it was like a steep learning curve for me, especially when it comes to wooks. Uh, I got like a very crash course in in wookery. Did you lose them (laughs) during the show and then have to find them afterwards? So (laughs) one of the girls I went with, so, you know, like I said, I was fresh out of high school. So I went with one other kid who was my age and then this one girl who was like a year younger than us. Um, So she was 17. And she met this wook in the lot and she like fell in lot love with him. Oh god. And he oh, didn't no. have he didn't have a ticket for the show. So she gave her ticket away to someone who showed her her boobs. And as she said later, they weren't even nice boobs. And she just hung out in the lot with this wook uh that she was in love with and didn't even join us what? For, for the show. <laughs> it it was like we literally drove 10 hours to go see fish for the first and last time, and girl didn't even make it inside. So, um, it was interesting. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, if she I, had a good eventually time, we lost him. Eventually, we lost that guy. Um, yeah, that is a story for another day. <laughs> oh my God. I want to have you and your friend on the show to kind of do a his side, her side, or I guess oh, her man. side, her side, but you know what I mean. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if she'd be willing to talk, <laughs> to talk about it. Honestly. Your on episode. <laughs> yeah. And Mike, what was your first show? Uh, my first show was um, was eight eight ninety seven uh, Tinley Park. I don't remember much except uh, it being a really crappy venue. <laughs> it was like a dust bowl. It was hot. Um, I, I was drinking a Sammy Smith's Winter Welcome, which I thought was interesting in August. <laughs> and I was like, "What's this all about?" <laughs> you know, uh, those were sort of the choices back then. It was that, and like Sierra Nevada and Fat Tire, if you were lucky. And that was the only show I saw that year, actually. And then my second show was Riverport 98, and then oh, went wow. to UIC, and then the MSG run. So I sort of picked up steam heading into 99, where I, I just went wild and probably saw like 25 shows. That's where I'm and at it, right and now. It, <laughs> yeah, and in 2000, I mean, I sort of blew up in 2000. I was going to chime in and say that I haven't been back to Alpine Valley since 2000 and was there in 99, obviously, but then went in 2000. So yeah, it's been like 23 years now since I've, I've seen a show there. And you've both got me beat though. I've never been to Alpine Valley or Deer Creek. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. That, that was uh, actually both venues were involved in both years. uh, Cause we did Alpine to Deer Creek in 99 and then Alpine to Deer Creek in 2000. Very memorable trips. Great, you know, great playing by the band. Mercedes, what was your most recent show? What did you think of it? My most recent show was uh, Night Four of Dicks. Gosh, all the Nights of Dicks, with the exception of Rain Night, all kind of blend together for me. But overall, that was just a great weekend. What a fantastic way to end the summer. I thought their playing was great. Like, there were definitely moments that were better than others and moments that, like, didn't you know, entirely hit the mark, but isn't that why we see live music? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and that's why we see four <laughs> shows in a row yeah, in the exactly. same venue. <laughs> yeah. Mike, what was your most recent show? Uh, my most recent show was um, was 12.30 at MSG, and I, I went to 29th and 30th, and w- I thought the 30th was actually a pretty great show. 
uh, and was was really pleased um, with the band. I mean, especially Trey's playing that run. I feel like he sort of kicked it back up a notch a little bit, like surprising us at times with some machine gun and lots of leads, less rhythm. And I was really stunned by his playing in the Golden Age because it had a lot of space to it um, and maybe a touch slower too. And it gave him more maneuverability. Um, and I thought it was really interesting cool jam I, overall that 22 was such a strange year because there were two new year's runs within the calendar year and i and it was almost like the april run was like a precursor to the summer <laughs> and then we're back at msg again a uh, next question up for the lightning round mike i'll ask you this one first uh so we can give mercedes a little time to think about it when you go to a show with a group of friends what role do you play are you the agent of chaos are you the caretaker, making sure everyone is in line, and like the cat herder, uh, trying to get everyone to the venue? Are you the even keel guy who you know just shows up and leaves? Who are you amongst your friends at a show? Well, one of my friends, as it at times called me the mayor, at, <laughs> <laughs> because it just feels like I know a lot of people <laughs> that we're walking up, and I guess I'm a gatherer, you know, and and probably a little bit more of. Uh, I, I definitely help to get people in trouble. Oh, I like that. That that sounds like a yeah. real politician, like a mayor. But yeah, you never no, get I caught. Mean, I, no, I never get caught. No, no one knows where it came from. Mercedes, who are you in your group of friends? It's so interesting. I, I think I'm trying to figure that out a little bit still. Um, <laughs> I don't have like a like one solid fish crew. A lot of my like fish going experience, I was seeing them either like by myself or with one other person. So since finding fish Twitter, that's really been the first time I've been like welcomed into a, a group or a crew. I'm definitely not the mom. I'm not like the one who's prepared with like a million things and like taking care of you like that that is not me. I'm also <laughs> not the agent of chaos. Like yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good at like keeping it together, but I can be a bit of a like butterfly, I guess. Like I bounce around the room essentially at shows um, when there's a venue where it's kind of like easy to navigate or if like a bunch of people, you know, are kind of in the same section, like I will definitely bounce around. And like, if I know, you know, if I know Hawes over here and that this they're playing his favorite song right now, like I might bounce over to dance next to him for that and then like go back. So I guess I guess the bouncer. Wait, yeah, the social that's, not, life. that's a different meaning. Social yeah, the, the social butterfly. Yeah, yeah. Mercedes, what's your most controversial fish opinion? Well, I like Farmhouse. Like I genuinely <laughs> like it. Like it's unironic. I want to hear it when I'm at shows. I don't need to hear it every show. But like I, I like it when they play it. Like to me, that one is not a groaner. Same with sample in a jar. I, I have to say, after doing as many shows as I did this past summer tour, I understand why fish fans from certain eras have feelings about some of the songs they do. The last like year and a half, I, I've said this before, Life Beyond a Dream. Well, I felt like it that was chasing me. I was not chasing that song, but like I would get it. I would get it at tab shows. I would get it at fish shows. I would get it so often that like now I get why people are like, I don't want to hear this song or like, oh, I can't believe they played this again. Maybe my genuine love of Farmhouse is my most controversial fish opinion. And I, I think the other one is that uh, I, I'm not hypercritical of fish. Like I said, I became a fan in 2.0. So when my first show was the show that I thought was going to be my last show. I'm still just so happy that I get to see this band that I thought I'd never see again. It's hard for me to like ever really get too down on them or their playing or, you know, the technical things. Cause I'm still like, this is so great though. <laughs> you say it again one more time for the people in the back. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Man, I try, but, but that's part of being a fish fan too, being hypercritical and being a nerd about the details. It's one of the things that unites or divides all of us. I find it interesting that you picked out sample in a jar and farmhouse going back to what you said earlier, that before you were a fish fan, you were kind of like a teeny bopper pop music fan. Cause I think those are two of their most accessible tracks. Certainly the album versions of each. I completely agree. And actually the track that 
turned me <laughs> into a fish fan or, or at least made me be like oh maybe i would like more of their stuff was uh if i could on hoist oh, um this is <laughs> it's beautiful that yeah, it's a beautiful song. It's got a female vocalist on it, Alison Krauss. Um, yep, it's a ballad. Yep. Like, I love the lyrics of it. And as, like, a teenager, like, coming from uh, the world where songs were shorter and um, I, like, always loved harmonies and pertinent lyrics, like, that song got me. So, yeah, I, I see your point. Like, Farmhouse and Sample in a Jar are very accessible, especially to fans of like more straightforward rock or pop add um, heavy things to the list yeah add heavy things and there's another one i was just thinking of as well oh i feel like people always say it's like bouncing around the room they always like yeah. joke about that one being the crossover song i actually think that one's kind of weird like that <laughs> that it, it's not really palatable to a lot of people like it's not the song i would pick to to show to someone trying to convince them to like fish because it's no. it's kind of a it's kind of a children's song. It's like got some row, row, row your boat vibes. Mike, yeah. what's your controversial fish opinion? Gosh, this is, I've been thinking about this. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I've been, I've been also sort of, I mean, I sort of go hypercritical to, I'm happy to be, I'm happy they're here. Um, and uh, similarly, like the timing of Mercedes is for a show. We got married the summer of 2004 um, in May and fish had, just sort of made the announcement. <laughs> yeah, it was May 25th, so yeah. It was kind of a, yeah, no, it was a week before our wedding. Uh, the wedding was May 30th. And so, you know, we actually had a band play and we played fish, like horns and all that stuff. But maybe, maybe actually, maybe that is my controversial opinion. I don't really like horns with fish because I think it changes fish, even though I'm a horn player. That's a good controversial opinion. I got to say, I, I was really happy when they did the Rolling Stones album at Indio and the horns are great. But honestly, I thought, um, oh, I always forget her name. Oh, rest in peace. Um, Sharon Jones. Sharon Jones stole the show that night um, just with her singing. And I also used to be hypercritical about the way they sung because I it was just crappy. <laughs> um, and I feel like they actually give a lot more and they've they've. They've said they've had vocal lessons and they care a lot more about how they sing. John, especially, you know, I remember him doing in the, in the, in the, in the old, old, in the great old summertime or something like that. One of these old time tunes at Madison square garden. I was like, actually this he's singing. This actually sounds good. You yeah. know? It's not like uh, he's, he's a, he's a, he's being a joke right now. The key question that everyone always has to answer Mike, I don't know if you've took this one already or not, but what is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? You know, it's probably not in the best way, but the weirdest thing, um, and I, this has happened twice, I think, uh, but the most recent was at Bader Field when I was, we were on like a platform, you know, in the field, great, great seats. And then you see out of the corner of your eye, an ambulance entering the concert field. And I'm like, no, man, really? And it stops like right in front of, our section you know not necessarily like a weird cool thing a weird like downer thing and yeah you know those are the things that more more or less freak me and 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 make me lose my my happy spot mercedes any weird things you've seen at fish shows that freaked you out good bad or otherwise <laughs> so it's hard to say right because like what is weird at a fish show we're all pretty weird when we go right. there and like weird is kind of normal there's two things that stand out to me one I realize is not particularly unique, but the naked guy at Dick's. I know there have been naked guys before, but I never got to see one. So <laughs> that was my first naked guy. You've never fish. seen a naked guy? Well, not, not, <laughs> at a, not at a fish show. <laughs> uh, I did. I was at Charlottesville in 09 with the naked guy came on stage during Yamar. <laughs> right. I know there have so been like a the, few. Yeah. There's been a few. Yeah. That, but, and but, that was. That was common. That was funny too. Like, I think it was a little bit shit. There's a guy on stage, but we're right. going to laugh about it right now. <laughs> and then the other one was um, this was at Shoreline in 2015, which another fire year, but um, amazing show. Great, yeah, great show. Going into to that venue. And I also thought this was funny too, because that's the Bay Area. And the Bay Area is like notoriously one of the least religious areas of this country so there's a preacher outside of the venue as people are lined up going in i mean maybe preacher is like being a little too generous but he <laughs> had like a 
a megaphone or, or a PA or something of his own. And he's just like, you know, yelling at all of us to get saved. And I remember one of the things he said was he just goes, you all have time for this weird little concert and no time for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> accurate <laughs> like i know exactly it's like also this kind of is our church though but yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and then and then people were like trying to get him like to take a ticket to come in and see okay. the show and i don't know if he i don't know if the guy got in i like didn't hang around for that I, that would have been a great story if someone convinced that man to go check it out check out the weird little concert himself when was this show played so let's talk about fish in the summer of 2022. Uh, it began with a four night run in Mexico in February and then the oddly placed four set of shows or four shows at MSG that April delayed from the New Year's Eve run of 2021. Fish then did an eight show. I put this in quotes spring tour before a 25 show summer tour. When I look at it, I think it's really a 33 show summer tour kind of like how they were doing it mm -hmm. now in 2023 even though they haven't announced the summer dates yet but i guess when you announce it as a spring tour you could sell more merch <laughs> is yeah. my guess but anyway this show at blossom was the 14th show of the tour so it was just past the halfway point of the tour <laughs> i was not very involved in 2022 fish uh, i got married in july mid-july right when the, sh the tour was getting off to a start after the wedding, the honeymoon was in Alaska. So it was by and large spotty internet service. I wasn't yeah. always able to check up. And that's probably better for attention to my wife and my marriage and ourselves. But I felt kind of out of place in the fish world because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't keep up with anything. And it was driving me crazy, even though I was on my honeymoon, that fish was playing two nights at Jones Beach and I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So that was a downer for me because for most of my life, that was my hometown show, but I was off the grid. Yeah. And what did seep through to me though, were only three basic summaries, I guess, three basic points. One jams were routinely coming from unexpected places. That seemed to be a trend in the summer of 2022. Uh, number two, Trey was doing something weird with his vocals, but through social media and not being able to stream anything, I couldn't tell what, I could just hear that people loved it and hated it. And three, people were complaining about too many repeats. Although when I did some research for this episode, I looked back at the set lists and that does not bear out no. in reality, especially when compared to previous tours. Like if you looked at Fish in 1994, yeah. to your point, Mercedes, earlier with Sample in a Jar, or you and were saying earlier, yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. And when people complain about when they got into Fish at a certain time, if you want to talk about repeats, Jeez. go back to the mid nineties, man, or the late nineties with the farmhouse songs. Yeah. That was not the case this year or 2022. No. Um, but again, like I said, I was out for most of it. I was only able to see the three night run in Atlantic city. So I guess Mercedes, I'd like to ask you first, what were your general impressions of fish in 2022 and what brought you to blossom? Yeah. So my general impression was, you know, I did think that they made quite a few repeats and I haven't actually looked at like, you know, all of the set lists or anything to see if that bears out or like what songs it was. Um, but I had done, I started the year with the spring opener in Alabama. Um, I did those three shows. I did Deer Creek and then I didn't get to anything until the end of July again. So I grew up in Cleveland. So Blossom was like the place you went. Like I saw Cher there when I was three or four. I saw Hanson there and the Backstreet Boys when I was <laughs> in my teeny bopper phase. I saw some iteration of the dead there with my dad once. Almond Brothers would always come through. So, and, and Blossom's a special place. Even if you're not from Cleveland, it's a very cool venue. So that kind of fell into like it being a hometown show for me. And I got to bring my brother, which was awesome. Uh, we ended up setting up a booth on Shakedown, which was hilarious. To sell what? <laughs> His friend was like selling some handmade shirts that he'd made, but mostly it was just like our tailgate. Like we weren't like super focused on the selling. We just, 
were there. It was great because we got to see everyone. And overall, I had felt up to that point that the tour was, I I thought, you know, fantastic. Like I thought they were consistently playing really well, but I didn't think there was much that was like different or that stood out um, or that was like really out of the ordinary, which is, which is fine. Cause I'll take great average fish shows, you know, over um, them not being a band or Coventry. I thought overall it was like consistently good. Um, and then there were moments of like excellence and, and euphoria and whatnot. Mike, what were your impressions of the, of the fish during the 2022 Well, um, I thought it was pretty damn solid, to be honest. And I think just to pick up on what you were saying earlier about repeats, um, I'm glad they're not doing no repeat tours right now. And I feel in some ways that idea has sort of spread into the set list where songs, they're they're actually spacing things out, I feel like a little bit more, but maybe not. (laughs) Maybe that's not true. But I also thought like, you know, coming off of Fall 21, which was obviously a peak you know, that was like, whoa, you know, every, every show was was crazy um, and it still holds up on tape. I think this is always one of the times it's 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 challenging for the band to figure out what to do. And I got a word, you know, after Big Cypress, it basically, you know, they were like, what the fuck do we do now, basically? <laughs> you know, and it was maybe a, like mini version of any time we have a peak, there's always sort of reformulation and what do we want to focus on now? Um, but to be honest, I thought that the shows were really good and Mexico shows were silly and they brought Shafty back. I remember watching Bethel, which I thought was a really good show. Uh, maybe the second night of Bethel Woods and Jones Beach as well. And I think one of the jams of the year was Leaves from Jones Beach. Back to what you said about like any jam can come from any song almost at any time. Um, and that was definitely on my mind a little bit. So I, I went to Merriweather and then Blossom and that was, that was it for me, but, but some Mercedes at both. <laughs> I think. <laughs> That's, <fun. laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. We did see each other at both. And then our seats ended up being like um, at the very front row of behind the pit, like in, in the, in Blossom. And you were like 10 feet in front of us. So I was like, Oh shit, there's Mercedes right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and those were the best seats I've ever had on a show uh, period. And, um it was like this is a gorgeous venue it, everything sounds great in here and the, the i mean the whole setup of the place is just fantastic it's a it's like a state park so there's nothing around it and it's just trees and it was really hot i remember that and we got on the lot at like three o'clock which never happens and i'm always like let's go you know and we were there you know it was really a cool experience and uh I mean, I thought the band's been playing pretty well. It's, it's like I said, it was coming off of a sort of a peak year, 2021, uh, and they sort of mixed, you know, mixed in some new ideas. And I think still, there's still, it's, it's unexpected what you're going to get, you know, and they still have that magic. Hi, everybody. Brian here to welcome you to the set break of today's episode of Attendance Bias. First, thank you for listening. And second, just a quick reminder to tell you that even though attendance bias comes to you for free, it does take a lot of work and it does take quite a bit of money to keep the lights on here at production. So I just wanted to ask a small favor if you could support the podcast in any number of the following ways. If you could leave a review or a rating of it on whichever podcast app you use. If you could spread the word telling a friend or someone you think may be interested in it about it. Or probably the most concrete way is to go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash attendance bias and donate however much you can financially to help with the continuing costs of attendance bias. So thank you again so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the second half of today's episode. Reopen the second set in three sentences or so. Summary of the first set. I was wildly surprised by the Strawberry Fields opener, the early Yem, uh, which they continued the like, oh, we're playing Yem like this now. We're going to do a jam after the vocal jam. And that that sort of tradition continued. And then I think there was a Reba also. It was just like, wow, that sounded great. I'm really pumped to hear what they're going to do in the second set. You know, it seemed open. It seemed like, yes, the band was, you know, pumped to be there. I just remember that first set coming out strong, 
and it just like kept hitting. I I thought it was great. And I remember when set break hit, you know, it's it's that perpetual feeling fish gives us of like, how can they top that? Or how how can there be more? Like, how is it gonna get better? Like it was that same kind of feeling. Like I, I can't wait to see what they're gonna do next, was how I felt when that set ended. Well, free is what they did next. And the <laughs> recording of it that I used, which is on fish.in, is an incredible quality recording. It's really good. Those of you listening who are married to the Live Fish app, it's great, no doubt. But if you ever want to get back to that really good audience quality recording, check it out at fish.in or the Relisten app. It's almost like a matrix. It's not quite there, but it's really good. And we'll get to, to Mike's bass, but it really does it a lot of favors. Uh, <laughs> but about two and a half minutes into free, is when I got the first indication of Trey's new, and I put question mark, new and improved voice vibrato. I don't know. Still the the jury's out for me. I still don't know. Um, and then there's that growly guitar tone that Mike mentioned at about four minutes, which I wrote it leads a lot of jams in recent years. So we're on the same page, Mike. It was slow and steady, and I like the groove that was even in the middle of free before they started on to the jam. I thought this was a really good and better than good. You could almost smell something was coming mm -hmm. a little bit later. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like Free has been kind of on a roll uh, <laughs> with them. Um, and, I, and I know there's the Mexico version with the Rescue Squad. And, you know, it it was prominently featured on New Year's with the pirate ship and all that. I, I, maybe from that point forward, it's sort of, it's not been like standard issue Free, like ever, almost. It's, it's always a little more interesting. And so, you know, I was really uh, intrigued when they opened with that. I was like, are they going to really open this up you know <laughs> and of course they they did you know <laughs> i thought that at the end of the song portion i wrote it's clear although it was clear to me that fishman and maybe other guys in the band thought that the song was over yeah. you know when they do the like they do that part yeah, yeah, that yeah. ends free but trey and page decide to keep it going it reminded me of like chalk Dis torture in mm -hmm. 2018 and 2019 when Fishman would always get tricked where <laughs> he was playing that big build on the snare drum, expecting it to end. And Trey would just now with the famous GIF where he, you know, moves his hand and they keep jamming it. I think that's what happened with free this time that Trey was just in the mood to keep it going and page as well. Everyone backed off at seven minutes. Page took the lead. And then this beautiful melody developed around eight minutes. It's like, it took no time at all for them to lock in and make everyone happy.
it then melts into a different key entirely for bliss jamming at around eight minutes and 15 seconds. I wrote, I can't wait to see where this goes. Planetarium fish. I always <laughs> picture myself on like, you know, when you're on field trips and you're looking up at a planetarium, that's soft, pleasant, gooey music that doesn't ever have an ending or a beginning. To me, that's what is at this jam at around eight minutes. Totally. Yeah. No, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a full, like, full band as an organism kind of kind of situation where everybody's sort of equal. And that's, and that's their goal, I think, at times is, is to not, not even be necessarily sticking out of the fray. It's just a combination of all of those things together with the groove. And it's ridiculous. A little bit later, not much later, though, around 11 minutes, I wrote extremely uplifting and inspiring. Yeah. I wanted to ask both of you, I don't know if you know the exact point I'm talking about, but what it was like to be there. I wrote in my head, I see people, arms around each other, hugging, smiling, high-fiving, and just swaying. And it happens again later, but this starts, I think, this really, oh, let's stand up and pay attention right now. This is going to be something to talk about in eight months, I guess, on a podcast. Uh, This is going to be something to remember around 11, 15, or 12 and a half minutes. Mercedes, I saw before we recorded, you had a a whole bunch of notes you got to share man what was I it do like have a bunch of notes all right you might you mind if i i'll take us up to the the 11 minute mark rat yeah, yeah you mentioned trey coming in with those those vocals i know someone on twitter once dubbed it like the vocal stylings of trey anastasio <laughs> and so that's like instantly where my head goes because it's this very theatrical musical voice that he uses to me it seems like I don't know how seriously those guys ever took th- their vocals, but now it seems like Trey is taking them more seriously. Like, like I, I feel like he's had voice lessons recently, like, and now he knows how to use it. But Trey, I've noticed this. Trey's like taking things up an octave, which yeah. is sort of the terminology. It's like he's, you know, the line is like, wait, it's twice as high as it usually is. And the best reference for this would be like when he first did this was in Sand, in three point oh somewhere. He like took like. Da, 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 da. And then it was like, whoa, that was cool. And that was the last line of the song before the jam. But that's from what I understand. I, I know some things about the vocal coach yeah. aspect of it. And he's like being encouraged, yeah, <laughs> to express yeah. it, you know, and to let it out. And for sure. Well, it's definitely and coming he can through. sing. Like he can yeah. actually he can play, he can sing the notes now. Like that's the other thing. It's sort of surprising to me. It's like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Like, I wonder if that kind of focus and attention on vocals had happened earlier. I don't know what what things might be like. And and I get that for a lot of jam bands, vocals are not their focus. They're like another instrument or um, like a means to an end sometimes is how I feel people use them. So anyway, I just like I like what he's doing with his voice sometimes sometimes i'm like oh it's like a little cheesy you know like a musical would be it is like a broadway tray situation it's it's very broadway tray and you know he's scored a couple musicals in recent years so it's not surprising that that influence comes out in his work um i think he's actually pretty transparent about his influences you just kind of have to i guess know what you're looking or listening for and then you can see those influences come out of tray in fish we're really reaching the end times for classic rock bands, like living members of it, where lots of people who we probably, I'd imagine, grew up loving and worshiping, we're starting to see them trend on Twitter for the wrong reasons. Uh, We start to see them, I think it was last week, Ozzy Osbourne said, I can't tour anymore. I mean, he's 75. But what a lot of classic rockers do, singers at least, they change the key that the song is played in live. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned this a hundred times on this podcast. I'm a big fan of Billy Joel. God bless Billy Joel, but he doesn't sing one song that he's written in the key in which it was written. He just mm-hmm. lowers everything because he can't hit the high notes anymore. Um, yeah. You know, you can laugh all you want. He hasn't played Uptown Girl probably since God knows. <laughs> right. But Trey is not going down that easy path. He's not changing or asking the band to change the key in which a song is played to fit what he's used to he's instead he's stretching what he can do to match Mm -hmm. what is expected of him 
Uh, and like I said earlier, I don't know if I like it or not. Mercedes, I'm with you. Sometimes I yeah. do kind of grit my teeth yeah. a little bit when I hear it. But as soon yeah. as it comes, it goes. And I mean, then we're in the middle of this blissful free. I was just saying, I mean, there's always going to be something that we get to roll our eyes about with Trey. And this is like the latest version of that, whether it's a whale call or like um, some other situation. You know, um, I just feel For like sure. this is sort of the latest. Hey. What is this? You know, yeah. something for us to com- complain about. <laughs> so the other thing I noted about this free is that even the intro of free is kind of jammy. It you, you kind of you kind of get the impression right in the beginning that like, and it's easy to say in hindsight, but you kind of get the impression in the beginning that like, oh, this isn't going to be your average free because by by the time we were barely four minutes in, which is usually when free is still in the structured part of the song it already sounded jammy like i already thought at about four minutes i was like oh we're in the jam already but and like they i think they did the chorus one more time but it just like had that feeling already and i'm so with you i noted the same times you did the eight minute mark i wrote that it was just perfect vibes like the vibes in that section are just pristine like yeah i think you described an aquarium like i i wrote that they were just dreamy like which is similar similar thing right it's just delightful like it's just a happy place like not um not the same happy place that we get to at the 11 minute mark like the 11 minute mark is like the fucking rocking happy place like yeah i wrote straight it's, forward it's rock more, and roll exactly yep. like it's a more um upbeat high energy happy place than that eight minute mark which is more of a dreamy light um groovy kind of like blissful um, and yeah, I'm with you on that on that 11 minute jam. remember that part being a dance party and i think Mm -hmm. that was the point where i forgot what song we were in which is fantastic when that happens always a good sign yeah i think that was also like when when chris started doing really crazy things with the lights and the light rig needs to be mentioned because this thing was outrageous and um i did shoot a video of it like during free it's like the it was a lot of purple and green and just a lot of just eye candy basically and it, mm-hmm. it matched it matched what we were sort of hearing the band do it was it was great um i think my favorite moment is like 13 minute mark and that's where for my ears they're almost riffing on like a fluffhead type cadence uh in the jam it's it, it reminded me of fluffhead yeah Thank you. 
It was like this really, and this is like what, what Fish does so well, like better than anyone else. They do the simple things like a three chord progression in the middle of a 25 minute jam that is full on hose, you know, and this goes back to like the Albany Yam in 95, the Went Gin in 97. They've got this like formula that they will insert when it's really happening. And it's sort of, they get there organically and it reminds you of other things. And it's like, God, so, and that's the thing that like, I love the most is like, they create this gray area where you're like, what, is it this, is it this? Oh, no, <laughs> you know, in your mind. You know, and, like, and... Yeah, I agree. No, I, I agree. And, but what I loved about this gem is there was so much of that gray area because it had touch points <laughs> where it would rock for like a two minute portion, which is actually quite long for fish. Usually they have Trey DD where like he'll yes. be really hooked on something for like 40 seconds and then completely abandon it. My next big note was at around 14 minutes or 15 minutes where it was like almost a Calypso rhythm. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine swaying back and forth, smiling and hugging during this. And the only <laughs> thing that was keeping me grounded. And by the way, this is on my couch. I'm not at the show of the three of us here. I was the only one who was not present. Uh, but the only thing keeping me grounded was Gordon's bass, which is heavily synthesized. It's yeah. not very straightforward, but it's of everything going on. It's the only thing keeping me like, okay, I know where we are. Yeah. And it's just so pleasant. Do you remember, Mercedes, do you remember that? Like, since the uh, island calypso part i'm talking about so i think you and i must have written the same notes <laughs> <laughs> because i also wrote the 14 minute mark like there were super cool effects i wrote that um there's like this this bass riff that is just like ripping that's yeah. like so good in there you kind of come into a different section of the this free jam i think around that 14 minute mark and it is reminiscent of Fluffhead. And how you might remember, so, um, I think it was Dustin tweeted a few months ago about this free. He said, you know, oh, at this point, it sounds like Hanson's Mbop. So of course I have to go back and listen to it, right?
And it does. But then as I'm listening to that, I'm realizing like, well, damn, Mbop and Fluffhead actually have a really similar riff at certain points. Yeah. You want to talk about controversial fish opinions? <laughs> yeah, there we go. I know, right? We're getting into it now. I mean, to be fair, I wasn't the one who initially compared it to Hanson. That was someone else. But I remember me and Ha in that thread when it was initially tweeted talking about it. And um, they it, sound checked it, it once. They you know, did. And that, in Italy. That, was, yes. that was technically the first fish song I ever heard uh, because of Napster. Were you I searching, searching Napster? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was searching Napster for Hanson songs and th- this That's... came up. I think it was listed as Fish's version of James Brown's James Hanson's Brown Mbop. Mbop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that was how it came into my world. And I, I thought it was funny. I was like probably 12 when I heard it. I thought it was funny. and I, I But I didn't have any context for like what fish was or who they were, I, I kind of figured something like Weird Al, which kind of isn't yeah, too far off. Not you know, far there, off. There's, there's a middle of that Venn diagram. Yeah. It's, yeah. They cross over. Uh, but I, will, I do think that, oh, that 14, sorry, that 14 minute-ish mark into, you know, into close up to the 16 minute mark, you've got this riff on Fluffhead or Mbop, whatever you want to say. It's like a different section of the jam that just like rips. And I think it's different from you know, the 14, 15 minutes preceding it. Um, it, it got to a really cool place. Definitely. I wrote that, uh, it, it kind of turns downward a little bit around 18 minutes. Like it's ready to rock again, or it's, it never really stops, but my head was still in the clouds from the past seven minutes. Like mm-hmm. I, I, it was hard for me to pay attention to what was happening in the moment because I couldn't get over what had happened in the previous five or seven minutes. And then I wrote it nine, 19 minutes. Is this the best jam ever? <laughs> uh, I know that it isn't my, you know, the head and the heart, they're not just a good band, but the head and the heart want different things. You know, in my heart, I ask, is this the best jam ever while listening in my head? I know it isn't really in my opinion, but that's how good this is. And well, you felt that there, like yeah. that's the thing, like the energy on, in the pit, like in that area was crazy. Like people were pumped up. <laughs> oh mean, yeah, there was a lot of hooting and hollering and like cheering, <laughs> and yeah, it was just like a really fun. It you was. Could feel, we were vibing yeah. off the band. They were vibing off us. It was like it was great. It was Blossom really did have some of the best overall vibes that I, that I think I felt all tour like just the yeah I know Mike you described it as like a hot day but I thought it was perfect, like perfect. the sun was out like it wasn't super humid like it was just this fantastic day and then that just rolled right into the night like the vibes were just so good and I wrote at the 20 minute mark that my note just says ripping as fuck yeah <laughs> like, yeah that's it there's Rip that it. ultimate incredible rock fill there's yeah. this part where they're they're by, they're building up, and of everyone, one person we haven't really mentioned very much, Fishman. at least musically, yeah, is Fishman, yeah. and yeah. his drums. You can hear his snare drum, especially even in the very very beginning of the jam. He uses a flam, which is how he's about to end. This is why I think he thinks free was going to end because mm-hmm. he keeps doing the flam hit that ends the song, and then from then on, he's just killing it. And he's always playing just a split half second millisecond behind, but he knows how to bring in fills 
that match tray with the big crescendos. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anything I said makes any sense right now, but uh, what Mercedes said at that 20 or 21 minute mark, that is the ultimate rock and roll fill. You may as well be the Rolling Stones in 1969 and just fucking destroy every stadium you come across if you're fish at 21 minutes in this free at Boston. I rewound it like five times just so I could feel that energy in my car. <laughs> At the 21 minute and 50 second mark, I wrote, hell yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's it. We're talking, yeah. we're speaking the same language. It's, I just exactly. more words. It's, <laughs> well, I mean, you're you're being much more descriptive, which I'm sure your <laughs> listeners appreciate. Meanwhile, for, for me, it's like, I can only describe how I feel. I'm not like super um, technical. I get like bogged down in trying to describe you know, Trey's effects or even like pinpoint what they are. I don't have my musical backgrounds in like piano, so I can like speak more to Paige. But then once you get into the effects of things, which, you know, Paige has effects, Trey has effects, Mike, you know, all of them, that's when I get lost. Cause then I'm like, now I don't know what sound I'm hearing or how to describe <laughs> this or whatever. Um, so, and I do think I personally tend to judge jams more on like how they made me feel. And especially how I felt in that moment or how I feel re-listening to it versus like the technicality of it. But, and this one has both. Yeah, this one really, this free jam has it all. It's got yep. a little bit of my hands in. It's got, you know, the rip in the rock and roll. It's got the uh, like light and dreamy, like bliss jam. And then, you know, the way it ends, it's kind of in this ambient it, well, it doesn't end for one, right? Like mm-hmm. it goes into Esther, but it, it just kind of comes to this ambient, more like abstract kind of moment before they leave free. And even before yeah. they get to that abstract, I mean, you're right. That's exactly how it does end in, and uh, segues right into Esther because Paige brings in his organ for not just Esther, but for about a minute and a half or two minutes before they start playing that song proper. Mm-hmm. But there's like bite-sized rock star tray portions uh, <laughs> in the last minute or so of free itself, free proper, where Trey's still just like noodling in a way, but it sounds so much more constructive and cohesive than a lot of 
I don't know, a lot of 3.0, I would even suggest, mm -hmm. where Trey's is trying to find his uh his groove. Here, it's there already. And I wrote bite size rock star Trey because compared to what just happened, that's the only way to describe it because he was stadium rock star Trey for the last 23 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And it's all about, you know, I've been listening to Fishman a lot and the roles, and those have been sort of a dominant theme of the last couple of years. And I, I think actually he just got a brand new set too before the New Year's run at MSG. Um, so he's 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 crazy. I mean, he practices so much. He's he's of the Segovia school where it's the first thing, last thing every day where he's it's the very first thing he does is the last thing he does, you know, um, and at his age to still have the flexibility and, you know, you know, I think everybody's playing sort of goes sort of up and down, but his has remained steady in my, and at times just unbelievable, you know, when they're really on. And this was one of those nights where it was like, I feel like the free jam, I know we can't talk about the whole set, but it sort of set up the rest of the show. Because some of my favorite playing also was in the Sense and Subtle Sounds jam, which I thought was sort of original. It sounded like they were working on some new ideas. And then they seal the deal when they go into Split Open and Melt. That's like, yes, they didn't screw it up. You know? <laughs> and I, and I, I had this thought back to like Nashville in summer of 21, which I was at, where they played, um, where there was like the Mr. Uh, Mr. Completely tease throughout the whole set and this ghost bathtub gin and then they ended with melt and we're like yes and everybody like puts their arms it's like you feel like you win the gold medal when that happens yeah when <laughs> so, they stick the landing yes it stuck the landing it was it was not life beyond a dream mercedes <laughs> <laughs> mercedes last thoughts anything we didn't get to touch on for free for uh, no, awesome I, anything yeah i don't i don't think so i mean i just like want to you know, this is called attendance bias. So I'll, re I'll revisit my moment there. You know, I love free. It's probably one of my favorite fish songs. I'm always happy to hear it in any iteration, you know, those chords and the way they play it, the way they hit the notes, it, it, the only word to describe it is free. You feel free when they hit that to open set two with that. And I was in the pit. I think this was only my second show ever in the pit and I had finally convinced my brother and his friend to join us because they had pit tickets too but they were like afraid of it because they uh they, they read the reddit boards about fish so they were like <laughs> very afraid of what the pit might be like and I was like just come try it you can always leave right like if you hate it you can go back to the lawn so I was psyched to have him there and then they opened with free and like just getting to also watch their faces like through that moment like I got a lot of joy from from being around them and their like excitement and to watch them get, you know, their faces melted too. Um, and just like, like I said about the show, it was just such good vibes and the vibes in the pit that night were great. Everyone was so happy and friendly and like, it was just wonderful. And yeah, this is such a fantastic jam. I'm glad that this is the standout jam from that show. And I'm glad that Blossom has a standout jam from 2022. Well, Mike and Mercedes, thank you both so much for making yourselves available for being so game. And I don't think we could have found a better jam for the three of us to talk about. I really feel Thanks. that way. So thanks, Mike, for coming back. Thanks, Mercedes, no for worries. coming on. Thank uh, you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Brian. This was great. Yeah, this is totally fun. And that's it for today's episode with Mike and Mercedes. And this was not a very statistic-heavy episode. We didn't really nerd out about set lists or dates. There were a few things I had to double-check for the attendance bias fact check. Attendance bias fact check. Mike's first show, August 8th, 1997, at Tinley Park, features Chicago bluesman Sugar Blue on harmonica for the encore of Hoochie Coochie Man and Messin' with the Kid. Double-checking the date, I was right. Fish's breakup announcement was on May 25th, 2004, just a few weeks before they began the first leg of that summer tour in Brooklyn. When talking about Fishman's vocals, Mike mentions In the Good Old Summertime. This is an a cappella song that has been played just twice by Fish, both times in the summer of 2017. The first time was at Northerly Island on July 14th, 
and then they sang it again at the Baker's Dozen on July 30th. The show at Shoreline in 2015 when Mercedes saw the preacher, or whoever he was, was on July 24th of that year. Big Jesus Dude, if you're out there and accepted a ticket to the show, please reach out at attendancebias at gmail.com. I would love to have you on the show. And finally, I never figured I would be talking about Hanson's pop hit Mbop on a Fish podcast, but here we are. Fish soundchecked the bubblegum pop hit from 1997 on July 6th of that year in Desenzano, Italy. Please forgive my pronunciation. And that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Mercedes and Mike for joining me today, Fish.net for their help with the fact check, and Fish.in for the amazing recording used on today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review of it on your favorite podcast app. You can also follow Attendance Bias on social media, but the best way to support it is going to www.buymeacoffee.com slash Attendance Bias and donating anything you can. Again, always thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias.